welcome to Tesla Lady Ava. Hey everybody, and welcome to yet another Cyberific Sunday here at the desk of Lady Ada. It's me, Lady Ada. This is my desk. With me, Mr. Lady Ada on camera control. And we had a lot of stuff uh, that we worked on this week weekend. So uh, get your questions and, and stuff lined up. I also uh, showed up in Scott's uh, live broadcast on Thursday and, and previewed some of this stuff. But we can jump right in. Uh, as always, thanks for uh, supporting us by purchasing stuff from Adafruit. It's what keeps the lights on, literally. Like right. we have to pay the electricity bill. <laughs> yeah, um, and okay. the people and the rent and all the things that keep Adafruit going. So thank you very much. You can do that at Adafruit.com. Yes. And uh, this week, normal week of shows and everything. The only difference this week, I think, Don Pedro um, or JP, one of the two, are going to be hosting yeah. show and tell. No disruption in shows or services. We just mix it up. Yeah. So it's not the same folks hosting the show every week. Cool. And uh, Lady Ada, take it away. What it's on your desk this week. Okay, well, let's start with uh, checking out the Cyberific CyberDeck PCBs. So uh, these PCBs just came in on Friday, which means it's we're ready to manufacture. So this is the CyberDeck bonnet. Uh, so it's in a panel, as you can see here. It's panelized. Uh, it's got this really cool silk screen from Phil B. I told him like go cyber and like we I think we said like make it giant mnemonic ish. I think that's what, kind of what we uh, yeah we uh, recommended. But there's like you know the hack the planet from uh, from hackers. Uh, it's got uh, two Stemma QT ports, two Stemma ports because uh, there's all the space in the middle. Um, this is where you plug your uh, hat or bonnet into, and this plugs into the Pi 400 using that angled header that we showed off. Earlier, if people really want to see it, I can, I can probably dig out a piece of angled header. Um, and then this is going to be selective soldered back here. It's got some cool silk screen on the back with like, you know, like VR gloves. They're always like in this, they're really always pointing and like grabbing. And then optical discs, also very cyber. Um, and then we've also got the hat version. So that's that was the bonnet, right? Which is you know a hat, like a Raspberry Pi uh, zero style size. And this is the full hat size. So this would be for like a full, you know, standard display. In fact, I have this, this Kibo that I've shown off for something else. This would plug in here. Um, and then you would have this plugged into your Pi 400. So um, ditto, it's basically the same schematic. Uh, there's a um, Cyber Dolphin, which is always cool to have. And then uh, same kind of back silk screen. So I told him, yeah, don't, don't try to like come up with a new silk screen for each side. Cause it was, it was taking a while. I wanted to uh, give Phil B a break because he was doing a really good job with the silk screen. So, you know, these two panels here, I'll hold them up so you can see the, how big they are. Um, we're going to run these this week. So we should have these in the shop. We got um, a bunch of those um, angled headers in, which was the thing we were really waiting for, the custom angled headers. Um, we'll put this in the shop and then you'll be able to plug this into your Pi 400 uh, for cyberificness. Any questions about that? I don't know. Let's see. So far, no. Okay, great. All right, the next thing is, uh, staying on the Raspberry Pi uh, topic, uh, why don't we jump to my computer? Um, so uh, this week was exciting. We, we released the Feather RP2040. Um, folks who didn't get one, uh, we only made a very small batch to start. We, we were making more, believe me, there is, there's tons being made. Uh, sign up and we're going to be over the next week or so uh, churning them out and notifying people. So so worry not if you do not get it. Um, one of the things that we realized as um, you know we were working on the, the Feather RP2040 is I, I didn't realize that um, flash memory, the if I wanted to use 4 or 8 megabyte flash memory, it wasn't available in 2x3 USON. And so that's the size that I used on the Rev B on the Itsy Bitsy. So let me open that up and I can I can show it off. Hello, Eagle Cat. Okay. Um, so this was the size of the flash. It was just very small. I mean, compared to the chip um, here. Let's uh, turn on the T docu layer. You can see how big this is. So compared to the chip, you know, this, this flash chip is, um, is really small. This is the size that we use on a lot of our tiny boards. And it's two megabytes, and usually two megabytes is a good amount, uh, except on the RP2040, we take half of that for the firmware. 
So we really wanted to have like four megabytes at least. Two was just a really a little bit too small because you'd only get half of that one megabyte for user file storage. So we wanted to go with four megabyte or eight megabyte and I didn't realize it because I don't know, like, you know, whatever, I, I spaced, that if you want to get four or eight megabyte size flash, it, it doesn't come in this package. I guess the die actually is larger. So knowing that I had to redesign this. So this is a lot of 0603 parts. Um, so it got a respin into a lot of 0402 parts. You see the parts got smaller. Um, this chip shoved over a little bit to give more room. Um, these two buttons kind of split apart. And then this is the um, new flash chip. So you can see it's a lot larger. This is a four by four WSON. It can be four megabyte, eight megabyte. Uh, there's still two buttons. I added this cute little diode. The diode lets you use the, the boot button as a user button. Cause like I'm there anyways, I had a little bit of space. So I shoved it in there. Um, so that got redone and also the uh, cutie pie also got redone. So same thing, you know, I originally had it with two by three use on and then, um, you know, realized after doing the layout, the, and the prototype worked great. I was about to ship it out and realized, uh oh, I got to revise this to be uh, a larger flash chip. So here's, here's the larger flash chip. It fits neatly between the two mounting posts for the USB, this is the bottom of the board. Um, same little diode thing, added the two test points. So I will be doing another prototype run with these two boards, um, but here's the good news. You're gonna get four or eight megabytes of flash on the Cutie Pie or Itsy Bitsy RP2040. Hey, you know, learn something new every week. That's what I learned last week. So those two designs well, are getting done. I mean, there's eventually just gonna be more and more. I mean. More and more what? RAM. Flash, yeah. Flash, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, eventually maybe there will be flash chips that are even bigger that fit to smaller, but you know what? It's always fine to go big because it's, yeah. like, on the Feather RP2040, I use a wide SOIC on purpose, um, and that means I can use any size flash chip, and in, in the end, we shipped with 8 megabytes, and people people are digging it. So, cool. Um, so that's that. What else did I have on the list? It was uh, with the Cutie Pie, and then... Um, oh, I have another. It's it's totally not out yet. Uh, don't ask. So I was working on a little bit of um, home automation projects. And remember, I made that Feather ESP32 S2. But while I'm waiting for the ESP32 S2 mini modules to come out, because I, that design is actually done, I'm just waiting for the modules to be available for purchase. Um, because to make the Feather, I'm using the little miniature ESP32 S2 modules. They're not, they're not quite available for large purchases yet. Um, so I thought like, oh, what if I made like something that's like perfect for a little home automation um, and it's a little house shape PCB. It's just like my prototype just to get the layout going. Um, on the back is an ESP32 S2 and there's USB-C over here. Um, I've got three um, analog input ports for like sensors or like, you know, proximity or like a, like a water sensor. I've got a water sensor kicking around here somewhere. Um, one question that we yeah. needed to. Yeah. Um, do we have any updates for the NeoPixel Trinky? The PCBs are ordered. I'm just waiting for them to show up. Okay. So when, when those That's come in. That's an update. Yeah, it's an update. Um, so this is the War Rover ESP32 S2, and it's got a TFT over here. Oh, yeah, this is a stomach QT connector. Uh, this is the boot button. Um, not a lot of stuff on the back, to be honest, but you can see this cool hatched uh, ground. That's because I'm doing capacitive touch. This is the first time I'm doing capacitive touch with the ESP32 S2. It has native capacitive touch. So I was like, let's try it out. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, so what I did is on the front, you know, we're going to make a nicer silk screen, but for now I'm like, it is a house. Look, there's a door and there's like a little shrubbery or something. And there's like, you know, maybe lights on the roof or something. Um, and there's like a little light on the door. So there's capacitive touch buttons. So these three are capacitive touch buttons. And this is a capacitive touch slider. So I've never really made a slider before. Um, so it's kind of interesting to try out. Uh, there's a doorbell and the doorbell is the reset button. And then this is a buzzer. So it's like the doorbell buzzer. And then uh, this is a humidity and barometric pressure sensor. So right now I just have it, you know, basically working with um, CircuitPython. I just have like a really basic um, example program. Oh, and there's a couple of buttons here too. So uh, when I move the slider up and down, you can see it. I don't have like really great resolution for the slider. It just goes from one to eight. 
but that could be like good enough. And then, you know, when I touch this button, left button or the right button, and then there's some tactile switches as well. And then I just have the dot star kind of doing this like little crazy thing going on here. And then this is an on off switch. So the idea is that this could be like a little home automation thing that would, um, you know, has Wi-Fi so it can send sensor data or read stuff or control stuff that you would then connect to like Home Assistant or something on your Raspberry Pi. So this is still like being thought out. I'm still working on it, but um, just brought up the hardware this weekend and so far so good. Like the hardware came up, TFT came up. Um, oh, and one thing that's kind of cool is, uh, I don't think, hold on. For the bootloader, oh, I don't think I have the bootloader installed. But um, when we, I do have the bootloader, we have the TFT screen on the bootloader as well. Oh, I thought I got it working. I think I didn't um, tell it which pin is the bootloader pin. But um, yeah, so it's gonna be all CircuitPython and like sensors and setting over Wi-Fi. So kind of like a, a little bit like the MagTag, but you know, with a TFT screen. Um, and it won't be battery powered. You'd have to plug it in because it's it's there's too much power being drawn by the TFT. Uh, okay, so that's that's it's not out yet, so don't ask. I mean, you can ask, but you're probably not gonna get it. Okay, answer. well, I'll uh, I'll what? do a question real quick if I can okay. answer this one. Sure. Uh, when will the Picos be back in stock? Uh, we don't know. We don't know. We get, get them. Here's what I'll say, because I think this is one of those opportunities for how companies can um, serve their customers and communities better. So you can place an order on other websites, and they'll take your money, but you're not getting a Pico because they'll do back orders that can last forever. And then when they come in in other stores and other sites, you'll race around to these other sites, and then you'll try to cancel your other order, and they don't want to cancel it, or maybe you're already charged and all this stuff. So I think for the community, one of the things you can do is find websites that handle it, maybe like Adafruit does, which is, you sign up and you get an email when we get them in stock. And yeah, sometimes we sell it before you know you can get a chance to order it. But if you order something on Adafruit, yeah, that means it's in stock and we're shipping it. Um, unless there's like, you know, some inventory error or something. But like basically, we decided let's design Adafruit. So when you're placing the order, it means that it's shipping immediately. We had it in stock. I think one of the things that happens is there's a land grab yeah. when Raspberry Pi or even you know there's other it's mostly Raspberry Pi, um, mostly. but there's, you know, there's been other electronics where, like, it's like been... high demand. High demand, and, and we could have done that for some stuff, but we don't do that. Like, when we launch a new product, like a MagTag or something like that, a lot, it's very popular, people want it. So, I think one of the things you could do is support the companies that are only going to ship stuff when they have it in stock, and maybe we can move some of the companies to go to that model. So, you know, it, I think it causes a lot of um, people to be really mean to customer service people. And I'm not talking about Adafruit. I'm talking about these other companies because I see it on Twitter and everything. They're like, oh, you, I bought it. You know, I, I ordered it two months ago. It still hasn't shipped. Yeah. And they're really mean to everybody. And It's like a Kickstarter for every product. Yeah. Why would like, you do that? Yeah. And if you look on Kickstarter, you know, a year goes by and people are like, I invoke my rights. It's like a, a, a spell they cast. So one thing you could do is you could just be like, hey, like companies that sell Picos, for instance, why don't you have a sign-up list, and when it comes in stock, then... And we're also very fair. We only notify, like, the number of people that we think would actually purchase it. So, like, you don't... We yeah. try hard and to make sure it isn't, like... If we get 10 in stock, we're not going to notify 1,000 people. And this is going to be... You know, the PS5, you still can't get it. You know, there's video cards. You still can't get them. There's a lot of scarcity for electronics right now. There's a lot of problems um, just making it enough for the demand. So I think when, when you know that, when you know the demand's always going to be higher than the supply, what can you do that reduces the friction and makes yeah. it less um, less of a burden on the people who want the thing? Anyways, so... That's what we do. So that's what we do. Yeah. And um, it's worked out really well. And, you know, although you can't... If you, play, if you place an order on a site that will take back orders, you'll never know when it's going to ship, if ever... For Adafruit, when you place that order, once you get the notification email, you know for sure you're going to get it. Yes. So, 
Anyways. And we even have a thing where we stash stock. We have always a couple extra in stock that you can't purchase. So if your order like gets lost in the mail or it gets damaged, we can replace it. So we have like a tricks even to make sure that people can get the thing that they yeah. order. We, so we a do couple our best. people are like, yeah, they like their RP2040 Feather. They ordered it and they got it. They signed up. It's totally it. real. We put them in the stores and they got it. And we also like to do things where like if you watch Ask an Engineer and we can put something in stock that's high demand during the show, we do that. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of like if you go to a concert back in the day, we will again, there's certain things that there's live music is worth watching. It's good to support the band there. We do that too with Adafruit stuff. JP's product pick of the week. We do a sale live from the product page. Yeah. So anyways, it's just like, it's just another way to think about how we're doing stuff as a company, as a community. Yeah, we don't like to do like weird trickery where it's like you order, but it's really a back order. It's like we, we if you order it, it's in stock. That's, I think it's, it's honest. And we have distributors and sometimes if we don't have it in stock, check DigiKey, check our other distributors. But like we, yeah. we try to be, there's no like, oh, Order now, you'll get it in four to six weeks. It's like, no, it's it's going to ship within a day or two. Okay. Um, oh, well, this is for not out yet, so you can choose if you want to answer it. Okay. For the uh, little smart home thing that you showed off, Yeah. Um, can it talk to smart speakers, or does it need a Raspberry Pi to go in between? It, wouldn't, it doesn't do audio on its own. It's just Wi-Fi. Um, if there is an ESP32 S3 rover module, probably in six months, eight months, I'll upgrade this to add Bluetooth support. But even then, I don't think it has Bluetooth Classic. I think it only has Bluetooth Low Energy. So you probably have it control your Raspberry Pi, which is running AirPlay, which I think is built into Home Assistant. Yeah. Like Home Assistant does a lot of this stuff. Okay, what's next? Okay, so next up, absolutely everybody at Adafruit except for like me is really into mechanical keyboards and they kept being like hey why don't you make like mechanical keyboard stuff and I'm like oh yeah and then finally I'm like fine I'll 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 take a look at this stuff so um I started looking at like kale switches and cherry and mech switches and keycaps these are some parts from a Kibo kit um because I was kind of interested like you know what's I know that there's like cherry mx and there's like equivalent and so I just sort of have to like Whatever I design, I want to make sure that it's it's both affordable but good quality. Um, so these are kale switches and uh, keycaps, and these are these are very cute. These for Pi Moroni, and then um, this the technique that they use. A lot of people told me like, oh, check out the the kale um, sockets, and I was like, oh, these are kind of cool. So these are little because the problem is is that like you know these you have to hand place and solder them, um, but what you can do is you can pick and place these little uh, sockets, and they're only a few cents a piece. Um, like 10 cents a piece and then what you can do is you can press fit in a key so here I've got uh, one key press fit but I can I can show the process so on the underneath of the key there's this uh, mounting nub the centering nub and then the two contacts normally this is uh, press fit into a PCB and then um, selective soldered or hand soldered but the sockets you know you you can use a mechanical like this is a mechanical plate to keep the socket steady but it does, you know, it does sit in place between the, the nubbin and the, t the socket. You can see the two nubs go into the socket thingy. Um, it sits quite well. Um, some switches also have uh, two more uh, centering nubs here. You can see there's one big nub and then two on the side. Um, and then these switches, you know, I'm, 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 I'm nowhere if I'm not doing RGB blinky stuff. So these switches have little slots. These are normally for like three millimeter LEDs that would solder through, but what you can do instead of having a, a through-hole LED is you just have, because this is uh, opaque, this white plastic is opaque, but if you can have something that shines through, right, um, you can get uh, RGB, you know, lighting into the, the keycap, right, which acts as a little bit of a diffuser. Um, so that's kind of cool, uh, and you've seen, like, mechanical keyboards that do this sort of thing. And then I thought back, you know, when I was showing off this uh, like a month ago, these reverse mount NeoPixels, I remember some people saying, oh, yeah, you know, you can use those with, uh, you know, some people are using those for keyboards. They're really popular in keyboards. And I was like, oh, well, that's handy. So let's, let's pull these out again because I got these samples. And then so this, uh, let me get like really close because they're so small. So this, um, this little uh, LED, it's so small, it's like actually not focused. 
So this little LED is, it's a NeoPixel. This is like the ground, data in, data out, power. And it comes on the reel like this, actually. So you pick and place it up and down um, right onto the PCB. And the neat thing about these is we see here on this design, it has a, a dot star LED on the top, which I'd like to avoid. If possible, it's best for me to be able to have all the components on the bottom because then the keys sit flat, the socket's on the bottom and the LED's on the bottom and I only have to put it through the pick and place once. Like anytime I have to put something through the pick and place twice in the oven, you know, you just, you just took more time, there's more risk of failure. Parts can fall off, parts can come askew. Single-sided is the way to go, right, if I can do it. So these could be my little secret, right? Because this is like just about the right size to fit, you know, to light up through here. In fact, I just sort of dropped it in there to show it. It's like it's the right, you know, if, it, if it's centered right underneath this little slot, this NeoPixel, which is quite bright, will do a good job uh, lighting it. I even have a... Maybe I could wire up a demo real fast. Cause so I've got a couple the... people have some things about keyboards. Yeah, tell me about their keyboards. Um, your keyboard dreams. Keyboard said cherry switches aren't considered that great. The Gatrons. The yeah, there's... The kale, is it Kales? Kales, Kales yeah. are way better. Kales are... And then are someone says, got to try the Kale Box series with click bars. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying... I'm getting all that stuff. So this is the... Uh, This is like very fine, uh, fine wire, but you can see this is, and this is like, you know, not full brightness. So these are quite bright. Um, and this through here is gonna look freaking awesome, right? Super cool. And then with the diffused, diffusion top, eh, just like this, you know, it'll, it'll light up pretty nicely. Not the whole thing, because again, it is only like from one, one side, but you know, it, it will light up the key. So um, I'm liking this, so I'm gonna get a reel of these LEDs, which I, you know, I, I showed off earlier. And I was like, oh, like it's just interesting for its, I thought, honestly, I thought that these reverse mount LEDs would be more interesting um, for some other, there's some other stuff I thought they would be interesting for. Although now that I think of it, you know, maybe I should um, revise my Neo trellises to use these because the, um, the 35 by 35, millimeter 3.5 by 3.5 millimeter neopixel leds did, did cause a little bit of like weirdness if they, they were it had to be perfectly centered and if there's any variation in the elastomers they were they're all funky anyways so i'm starting to you know put together some pieces um yes you know i might not use literally cherry mx's uh these are kales i'll probably use kales or or gatrons mostly because you know people seem to like them um and i can get them uh you know in large quantities um, that said, uh, I thought maybe I'd just show off some of some of the designs that I, I came up with, and then we'll we'll jump into the great search. So let's go to my uh, computer. So the first thing I did is just like the basic breakout, right? Because I gotta like, I gotta figure out what is my, what's my process here. So, um, so it's a little tough to see. Maybe I'll turn off the. Uh, place a little bit. So this is the top of the switch and this is the switch itself. You can see this is the square part of the switch. And um, this is that slot that is uh, in the bottom of the key. So this is the, the mounting hole. This is the socket here. This tab over here, this is the socket. And that's why there's a hole here, not a contact, is because it goes through the, the PCB. This is the slot, so this is actually a cutout, and you can even see the four pads of the NeoPixel. So then maybe let's, let's look at the back and flip this around. So this is the back of the PCB. So here, you can see the socket. So this is the socket. This is the socket. This is the diode. So this means it, the diode you put in line just so you could, um, you can more easily, uh, put it in a matrix if you wanted to, although I don't think people will be using this matrix. Basically, it was like, for two cents, I'll put a diode in, why not? This is the reverse mount NeoPixel with this with this slot. You have to have a cutout. What size cutout? I don't know. I, I drew this, and we'll see how it goes, right? Prototypes of prototypes. Um, and then I, uh, 
I sort of made like little, little breakouts here. This is 0.6 inches apart, so you should be able to breadboard this. And I kind of designed it so that you, you know, you have to connect power and ground, but then the output of one NeoPixel can go to the other one, so you can change them together. Um, so this would be for like breadboarding, like, a, you know, a couple keys just on like a solderless breadboard or a perf board or something. Um, like a one, a one key breakout. Do a little capacitor here. And, you know, power it from three or five volts and you can, you know, make your own little, little switch breakout. Um, then, uh... I thought maybe to make a feather wing because that's always good for prototyping. So what did I call these? Neoki. I'm still thinking of a name, but I kind of came up with Neoki just so I can so have a So it. far, no objections to Neoki. Okay. Look, I I don't know. We're going we're gonna to talk about it. We had, we had ideas. Um, so this is a two-key feather wing. Three keys doesn't fit. And I wanted it to be within the feathering shape. So you can see one key here, uh, one key here. You know, they're 0.75 inches apart. Same KL socket over here, KL socket over here. NeoPixel, NeoPixel, key A, key B. They're connected by default to pins, you know, three, you know, five, six, and nine. But you can cut the traces and then wire them to whatever. There's a breakout for every pad. So if you want to do custom. But I thought, like... For most people, you know, they want to stick this on a, you know, a blue fruit uh, feather wing or like a you know, blue fruit feather or a, a Wi-Fi feather, an ESP8266. You can make a quick little NeoPixel controlled two key thing and you can, you know, just, just to get you going. And then if you really want, you know, put two feather wings side by side in a doubler and you can wire them up to um, different, uh, different pins. So this is just a little like a du double key. And then... Um, Phil recommended doing a four key thing. So this is four keys in a row. Whoops, that totally didn't work out. Uh, hold on. So this is four keys and this is a Stemma QT breakout. So what I'm gonna do is have a Seesaw chip, a little Sam D10, that'll take I squared C commands read them, convert them to NeoPixel and uh, keypad reads. So like you'll you'll be able to read the four keys and the, uh, write the four NeoPixels um, over I squared C. And the reason I am doing Seesaw and not um, like an AW, like 9523 or other GPIO expander is because I want to have a lot of address pins so that people could have like eight of these basically. I just want to have like a ton of, of, of address pins so the they can have a lot of these chained together so you could you know make like custom grids of any size really. Um, and uh, I was, I wanted to do this instead of like having like 15 different sizes of like keys. I feel like a one by four, it's like you could then make, you know, one by eights or like four by fours or three by fours, you could kind of like go to town. And, um, and then just chain them together with Stemma, which would be like so cute, and then change the address, um, and you're good to go. So those are my three ideas to start with. So um, I'll get those going. I'll probably start with just the, the single breakout, just to like, you know, work out the socket and like how to pick in place and, so and source it in this like reverse NeoPixel mount thing. Um, so that's that's kind of what I'm doing there. So any, any questions before we get into the great search? Yeah, it looks like the NeoKey name. And reminds them of Neo Geo, Neo Keo, Duo Keo, Quattro Keo. <laughs> okay. All right, cool. Well, we, we, we rambled for a bit. So let's go, uh, let's get on to the great search. Where in the world is that part I need? The great search with DJ Key. All right. Every single week, Lady Ada and DigiKey bring you the great search. This is where Lady uses her powers of engineering to use the DigiKey site. This segment's brought to you by DigiKey. Thank you, DigiKey. Lady Ada, what is the great search this week? I'm glad you asked. This week, we just talked about designing some uh, Cherry MX compatible switch projects. I'm working on this NeoKey prototype. And uh, I want to get started quickly. And so uh, to make sure that this stuff all works with Cherry MX switches, I was like, Oh, I should just pick up a couple Cherry MX switches. You know, I'm going to put in a DigiKey order tomorrow. I'll just toss in some Cherry MX switches. 
And I realized, like, hey, I should show people you can get Cherry MX switches from DigiKey. You don't have to, like, go to a special keyboard site. Support your local keyboard site, but you can also just add a couple to your DigiKey order. You can also get sockets, and I'll, um, I'll show those off as well. So, um, yeah, this, this search in particular is not uh, going to be that exciting because you just type in Cherry MX, and uh, I just searched you for found it. Insta. Yeah, there's kind of like, it's it. Um, so there's a couple of different switches, and um, here's the options you have in stock. And you're probably like, what's the difference between these? Um, well, some of them have like a little panel mount lip, it looks like. Um, but there's basically the clicky type and the non-clicky type. And blue is clicky. So if you um, go over here, you can even see audible click is the, um, is the type for the blues, so the blue stem. And then um, black or linear. And they have a lot in stock. And um, what I also thought was cool is they have, uh, oops, they have the uh, 3D, the, the 360 view. So you can like, this is kind of neat. You can like rotate this around so you can see the bottom. They had a really nice uh, 3D model. So um, for the, oh, it's interesting. This has, you can even see there's a little marking on the bottom that's like for the diode. Uh, and then uh, nice mechanical um, diagrams. I will say like not all keys have really good mechanical diagrams. Uh, the Cherry MXs do. Uh, there's also, like I said, the blue, blue type. Um, so for these, they're, they're, they, they have a clicking sound and you can like pick them up, you know, they're basically like 70 cents a piece. Um, and you can kind of get like tens of thousands immediately. So if you just need a lot of cherry mix, which is, and they're like genuine cherries, uh, you are super set. Another thing I saw while I was looking for switches is people on some like keyboard reddits talking about sockets for these. Um, so you can actually, you know, instead of soldering in the pins directly, you can solder in these like ultra slim Milmax sockets and then use those as you know mechanical sockets to um, place and replace your keys. So if you start with Cherry MX blacks and then you're like, now it turns out I want blues or vice versa. You like the clicky, you don't like the clicky. Um, so the there are two series you wanna look for. It's the Milmax um, 7305s and the 73, oh, hold on. I told you, Milmax 7305s. That's weird. Let me try the, the main search. No max seven three oh five. Oh, I can't type. Fourth times charm. Max seven three oh five. Why is it taking me this LED? Weird. Okay. Anyways, maybe because I don't have a dash. Um, but the, the, the Milmax, so, you know, they, they're not designed for use with, um, the, uh, Cherry MXs, but they work great. So these, the 7305 series are the gold, uh, plate ones. They're going to be a little bit more expensive. And then there's the 0305s and those are the tin plate. Um, some people really want the gold plate, you know, I get it. Um, let me try... If you just go to terminals, pin receptacles, and I search for Milmax, and then under series, I'll select 7305, and then 03, oh my goodness, there are so many pins, 0305. Um, they're really similar, but yeah, one's, one's gold and one's tin. You'll pay more for the gold. Um, and then you can get different contact finish thickness. I don't think you really need more than, than 10 uh, micro inches. But oh, let me see what's available. So in stock, you can get the 7305. Let me see this one. Oh, they're actually both gold finish. Oh, one is, hmm. Oh, they're different lengths. So there's ones that are a little bit longer. Um, but this is the one that I pretty much saw everyone linking to. So if you're going to pick up the 
Cherry MX switches and you want to hot swap them, um, pick up also the 7305-0-1515-4727-10 or the DigiKey Partner, which is much shorter. It's the ED1039ND uh, from Milmax. Um, you'll need two of these per switch. Um, but the good news is you don't have to change the footprint that much. I think you just want to make the hole, like the hole is just a little bit larger. Um, but this looks like let's look at the data sheet let's see if that downloaded no nope. oh no it's probably gonna have my my app blocker um but if you sorry for the um for the inner diameter you'll just want to make sure that when you're using these with your switches, that they're this, the switch pins have to be square. They can't be rectangular. So for example, like uh, Kale and other switches won't fit as well because these, if you look, they're like, they really need to be like a square pin um, connector. But for Cherry MX switches, apparently they work really great. So those are my two recommendations. Uh, you know, I, I basically was looking for these anyways to um, put together my keypad design. So I'm going to pick up some of these. I'm going to try out um, these uh, quick sockets. Um, you do have to hand place them, but then you can solder them in place. And a lot of people use these for existing keyboards that they want to turn into hot swap keyboards. And that's my great search. All right. Where in the world is that part I need? The great search with DJ Key. All right, some follow-ups. Okay. Um, maybe this can be for your future one. Uh, how does one find a two millimeter to two point five four millimeter header converter? Be for a future one, or you can. Use... Oh, um, well, we have these cables that you can use. This, there's no real converter. Okay. But you can. Um, I think we have these um, two millimeter um, socket cable. I don't remember what it was called. Yeah, these. I use these. I mean, like, okay. they're okay. Um, does this, did that search also cover Cherry Compatible? I don't think the DigiKey stocks Cherry Compatible. Um, I couldn't find any, but they definitely had, like, genuine Cherry MXs because they people have been using them. Before mechanical keyboards, people have been using them for all sorts of, like, interfaces. Data right. sheet did not download. Very weird. I'm clicking it. It won't download for me. All right. Well, calling it here. Yeah. All right. That's our show for the Sunday. Thanks, everybody. It's going to be a clicky time, so stay tuned, and you'll see as I uh, as I design these um, fun keyboard accessories, and uh, send over your favorite keyboard projects. Yeah, we'll have stuff for Feathers, for Picos, for RP2040s, you name it, we'll have it. Stay tuned. See everybody during the week on all the shows, and thanks for supporting Adrian. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.